You're listening to 15 Minutes, where we feature community leaders sharing what the rest of us should know but likely don't. Hi, Chad Franzen here, one of the hosts of Share Your Voice, where we talk with top-notch law firms and lawyers about what it takes to grow a successful law practice. This episode is brought to you by Gladiator Law Marketing, delivering tailor-made services to help you accomplish your objectives and maximize your growth potential. To have a successful marketing campaign and make sure you're getting the best ROI, your firm needs to have a better website and better content. Gladiator Law Marketing uses artificial intelligence, machine learning, and decades of experience to outperform the competition. To learn more, go to gladiatorlawmarketing.com, where you can schedule a free marketing consultation. Robert Ahern is the owner and president of the law offices of Robert D. Ahern, PC, a Massachusetts-based personal injury family-owned law firm. He has been practicing personal injury law for over 34 years and has handled cases involving motor vehicle accidents, motorcycle accidents, medical malpractice, wrongful death, and consumer fraud. His daughter, Ashley Ahern Glynn, joined his practice in 2022. Hey, Bob, it's great to have you today. How are you? Hey, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Hey, uh, when and how did you know you wanted to become an attorney? Good question. Uh, So the town I grew up in, um, in Milton, Massachusetts, was uh, very affluent. Uh, My family wasn't affluent. Um, So I had friends who, you know, went on the family vacations and had, you know, nice clothes and did a lot of stuff. And uh, we didn't. So I'd always, what does your dad do for a living? You know, I'd say six times out of 10, uh, he's a lawyer. I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to be a lawyer because I don't want to be poor the rest of my life. So that's basically why I did it. Plus, Secondly, you know, I, I do enjoy helping people a lot. Um, and, and I knew I was pretty intelligent, you know, as you know, you get into school and you get ranked and you put into certain levels of school and I was always in the top level. So I knew I was pretty smart. And I, I should probably be able to handle it, you know? So it was, it was probably way back when, when I was a kid. How did you uh, kind of get into the legal industry then? Uh, well, I'll tell you one of the craziest stories you're probably ever going to hear. So I, uh, when I got to college, I just, um, had fun. I didn't really study. <laughs> um, and so I, I, I figured I better get my act together. It was too late. I, my group, my GPA wasn't very good when I graduated. Um, but I took the LSAT and I got almost a perfect score. So I said, okay, well, maybe I can get into law school now. So I applied to every single law school I could think of, probably about 15 to 18 law schools, got rejected from every single one of them. Um, And then I got a postcard in the mail out of the blue uh, from a school out in California called California Western School of Law. Um, And the school is set up to take in people like me, who they think are pretty bright, should be able to handle the work if they commit themselves. They take a chance on you, you know what I mean? Because they tell you from day one, we're going to flunk out a third of you. Everything's based on a curve, all the grades. So it's very, very competitive. It's very, very scary when you're out there, you know. Um, But if you, you know, apply yourself and do your research and um, do your studying, you can can get by out there. So I did research on the school, fully accredited law school in San Diego. I had never been west of New York City. So I'm like... Okay, I'll give it a shot. I've never got have any other options, basically. So uh went out to San Diego, and I think I came in fourth out of my class. I had like 300 people. So I think I was on the right track at that point. Yeah, absolutely. Wow, that's amazing. What do you what do you attribute to your success on the LSAT? Um, I've always been very, um, very good common sense wise. And I think a, a lot of the questions, and I told my daughter this the same thing um being a lawyer is really about having good common sense and being able to analyze any situation uh using your common sense and what you've learned in your training so i think the lsat is a, a lot of common sense questions you know what i mean they don't ask you what are the elements of an assault and battery do you know what i mean on the lsat it's all more or less common sense questions can you put a and b to equal c together and get the right answer. So I've always been pretty good at that. What kind of attracted you or how did you get into then um, personal injury, um, personal injury law? Um, So 
after my first year of law school in California, I transferred to Suffolk University in Boston because uh, I knew I wanted to, I'm from here. I, I knew I wanted to practice here. So um, I got a clerkship at a, a insurance company um, defending personal injury claims. Uh, it was a pretty interesting job. They also took in some plaintiff stuff too. So we got to see both sides um, of how the system worked and how you can potentially make a lot of money in personal injury if you hustle and do a good job. And, you know, um, and on the flip side, I saw how, how they defended claims and made people look like victims who shouldn't be made to feel that way. And I didn't like that at all. So um, that's that's kind of how I got into personal injury. Yeah. How did you? So. I, th- I think you have experience as a uh, defense counsel for the insurance industry. How did that shape your approach to personal injury cases? So I didn't like how they treated people. And, you know, your job was to diminish the value of the claim. So you back then they didn't have the internet. Like now the, this is a lawyer's dream for the internet, defense lawyer's dream. You can go and, you know, mm-hmm. get a lot on a, pe- on a person online. Uh, but back then, you had to use other different software and different things that were available. Look up their medical background, you know, see how many claims they put in. You know, are they a frequent flyer putting in claims? And, you know, are they suing Disney World one day and, you know, American Airlines the next day and um, things like that. And I just mm-hmm. didn't like how they treated people. And, you know, you, you take their deposition, you're asking them about prior injuries and all, all with the goal to diminish the value of the claim. I didn't like that. I didn't go to law school to make the insurance company more money. I, I didn't. So I switched sides. I, I, it's like Robin Hood. I went to the good side. My job is to get the money and give it to the people that deserve it. I want to play in Florida until to the day I die. Very nice. Very nice. So um, you opened uh, the law offices of Robert D. Ahern in 1999. What kind of motivated your transition uh, for working for a law firm to opening up your own practice? Yeah, so I was a, uh, was a partner in a firm and. Um, I brought in most of the business or a lot of the business. I brought in all the personal injury business and I wasn't getting a hundred percent of what I was bringing in. I mean, I made a decent salary. It was okay. And I was a partner. Uh, but I, I just saw the potential of what I was bringing in to be much greater than what I was making. Um, so I, I think I had at the time three children, which was kind of nuts. And I just said, you know what, I'm going to try it. I'm going to give it a shot and go out on my own. Um, so I just, I think I saw the light, how much you can potentially make if you hustle, if you do a good job, um, and if you get word, the word out there, you, you can make it. You have uh, handled thousands of personal injury cases. How has that experience shaped the way you represent clients now, or have you just done it the same way all the time and it works? Um, no, no, no. Every case is different. I mean... Mm-hmm. Um, when someone gets in an accident, it's an, I don't know if you've ever been in an accident or auto accident. I have, yeah, but not, not, using, not with an attorney. Yeah, yeah, but most people have. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's a, you know, it's a horrific experience. Your whole life is turned upside down. Um, and you're in pain sometimes if you get hurt. So between work and your family and dealing with medical issues and bills, and then all of a sudden all the forms and the telephone calls start coming from the insurance company. It's, it's just nuts when you're in an accident. So. Uh, I really enjoy helping people through that whole process. Um, and But every case is different because, you know, I've handled death cases and I've handled, you know, whiplash cases. So uh, there's some cases where the, the person needs to get money as soon as possible. And there's others that say, you know what, I'll go all the way to the Supreme Court. I don't care. Just get me the most money you can. You know what I mean? So um, every case is different based on the situation, whether it's, their injuries or their social situation. Uh, but I treat every single one differently. And I, I think that's been a successful formula for me. Yeah, sure. Is there, uh, you know, out of those thousands, is there one that you look back on and think like that was a particularly memorable case? Um, yeah, I've had a bunch. I mean, um, I tried a medical malpractice case for two weeks. from a police officer who uh, had a heart attack was in the hospital. And uh, he got to the hospital, and as they're transporting him um, in the elevator, they uh, they didn't put a defibrillator on him. He died in the elevator. So that was a two week trial against uh, two or three doctors, and um, uh, we came close. The court officer said, "You were this close, Bob. You know, but 
we got it to the jury. I did it by myself. And uh, I'd say the number of lawyers who have actually tried a medical malpractice case is probably one to two percent. They fight them tooth and nail, and you got to know what you're doing. You got to have good experts, and uh, they're tough cases. I'll, I'll refer those cases out now that I'm on my own because they're very expensive to pursue. Mm. So, and I, the other case that really, so there's still there's two more that kind of bother me. Uh, I, I had a guy in a motorcycle accident years ago. A uh, pizza delivery guy cut him off and uh, crushed him into a fence. And I went to visit him in the hospital. He called me and, you know, signed him up. And then, like, three hours later, he called me back, and they had amputated his leg. So, and there was no insurance, really. And I, that kind of bothered me. Um, the last one was, and this was when I was doing defense work, I helped uh, defend a case of a truck driver who was driving down the street. And a girl was at a, a, um, a bus stop. And she looked right, saw the bus coming and jumped out in front of a truck and got killed. But I had to defend the truck driver. It wasn't his fault. But just the pictures and dealing with the family, and that was, that was just horrific. And that was one of the last um, cases I handled as, you know, on the defense side. I just couldn't deal with that kind of stuff. It was, it was horrific. But it was, the right, it was the right approach because the truck driver wasn't at fault. How did you kind of keep yourself from, you know, getting sucked into maybe the emotions that might come with that? Yeah, that one was hard because I think I had young kids at the time too. So, um, and the and that was I, I'm going to say it was 32 years ago, and uh, mm. I can still see the girl's backpack. Wow. So yeah. Uh, what was, what prompted you to divert diversify your practice into assisting uh, businesses and individuals with collections needs? So that started out as I was trying to get a niche into um, chiropractors and physical therapists. So I said. They must have some collection issues. So instead of just calling them up and saying, "Hey, I'm a personal injury lawyer. If you, you know, if you have any referrals, let me know. Any patients?" I said, "Do you have any collection needs?" Oh my God, yeah. We, you know, we wrote all. Okay, I can help you with that. So I get to know the owners uh, and the physical therapists, and you know, you do a good job and say, "Hey, by the way, I do mostly personal injury." So that's how I got into the collections, and then I swear to God, there was a huge party. Except my name started getting passed around, and all of a sudden, um, I had dozens and dozens of businesses in the South Shore call me, um, you know, and I, I, I like to think I do a good job. Uh, I can be uh, mean Bob or I can be nice Bob. Mm -hmm. I asked my clients, you want, you want to maintain a relationship with this person? Or do you want me to, you know, take the food out of their mouth and get you paid, which I, I can do with, you know, letters. I have different letters I can use and different things. I've taken people's cars while they're at work. I've you know, garnished, uh, uh, bank accounts and there's all kinds of things you can do, but it depends how far they want to take it. Speaking of kind of kind of who you should be, how do you kind of balance representing clients? You know, getting developing kind of a personal relationship with them while at the same time, you know, maintaining a high level of professionalism. Um. Well, that I try to do the best job I can for everybody because my business is word of mouth. And I've been on my own for since 1999. So what is that? Long time. 25 years. Yeah. So it's all word of mouth. I don't have, you know, I'm not like these huge firms and mass advertising and you know who they are on TV and billboards and everything else. It's all word of mouth. And it's like, you know, a movie. If, if you hear someone say a bad review about a movie, you probably won't go to it. But so it's like a lawyer too. You know, if you get a good reviews, you know, you're going to get referrals. It's all word of mouth. And I want to, I want to have, a word of mouth referral as opposed to, you know, someone who just calls up because they saw a billboard or something. You know what I mean? I, I want a qualified referral. So if someone is calling me, they've already been told, this guy does a good job, call him, you know, he'll take care of you. So um, I, I try to be obviously professional about it. My, the one thing I've always strived to do is give straightforward, frank advice. Uh, if I tell if your case is not good, I will tell you you don't have a very good case. Um, there's different ways to resolve cases, so I'll be professional and say I think we should go to a jury. I think we should arbitrate this. We definitely should mediate this. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. But every like I said before, every every case is different, so you have to be able to maintain your your wits about you, your professionalism, but be able to give them good good advice. 
So speaking of, you know, giving kind of advice, what advice would you offer to someone who is considering pursuing a claim for personal injury? Um, I would say after you've reported the, your claim, the first call you should make is to, the, is to the, an attorney, a personal injury lawyer. You really should, because having been on both sides, from day one, the insurance company has now started their investigation on you, okay? And if you put something on social media that you shouldn't, that you didn't know they were going to look, do you know what I mean? Uh, or the certain deadlines, you didn't know you should have filed this application or this affidavit on time, and they use it against you. So the best advice is call a lawyer right away. Um, it's like an analogy I give is if you had a, a baseball signed by Babe Ruth, would you just walk into a sports memorabilia and say, hey, how much will you give me for this? No, you, you do some research and you probably have someone, you know, give you a, an expert opinion. Well, go get an expert opinion. Talk to a lawyer. It's free. We don't charge you right from the beginning. We just take a contingent fee at the very end. And so the whole time we represent you, you're not paying us a penny. We're not billing you by the hour. So it's crazy not to call a lawyer. And as a matter of fact, the insurance companies will tell you, oh, you don't need a lawyer. We'll take care of you. That should be the biggest red flag you've ever seen. So you should never, you should never assume that, oh, well, I have insurance, so I'm fine. You should, uh, you know, look beyond that. Yeah. What's the business of insurance? It's not to pay out money. It's to make money. Their job is to keep as much money in-house as possible. And people don't realize that. And the buildings in Boston, tallest buildings aren't named after the lawyers. They're named after insurance companies for a reason. They have all the money. How do you... Uh... How do you kind of stay current with developments over, over the years in, um, you know, personal, personal injury law and legal practice? Uh, well, I mean, like Lawyers Weekly and um, just word of mouth talking to the lawyers. And um, in my business, there's only a certain number of things that can change. It's mostly dealing with um, the insurance policy. Like a case will come along and find a little niche in the policy that, uh, that they didn't think about the the standard, the people who make the standard auto insurance policy. So all of a sudden the next edition comes out and they address that. So now they don't cover that, whatever, whatever it is. So we get bulletins uh, all the time on stuff like that. So with regard to, you know, how much a case is worth, I can, I can do that in my sleep at this point, but uh, this case is all the time in lawyers weekly that, kind of, you know, confirm what I believe anyway, but um, there's not much to to keep up with except for the insurance issues that come up every once in a while. What prompted your involvement with the, the Make-A-Wish Foundation and also the establishment of the Memorial Fund? Yeah, so my brother uh, passed away of lung cancer. He was 33 years old. Uh, before he died, I asked him, you know, what do you want to do? Do you want me to... Um, set up a fund at Dana-Farber or something like that. And he goes, no, do something for kids. So uh, we did the, the Make-A-Wish Foundation and uh, did a golf tournament every year. I think we did it for 11 years um, down at Pembroke Country Club. And uh, we sold out every year. We had a waiting list every year. Uh, and I think we donated it. I know it was north of $100,000. I think it was about $118,000 we donated over the years. Um, and it was just a lot of fun, a lot of work. And uh, I said, once we got to hundred thousand dollars, I can't do this anymore. It's just way too much work. You know, my family obviously was very helpful in, in getting involved with that, but it was just a lot of work putting that together every year. Is there um, what role do you believe technology plays in the practice of law, particularly in the field of personal injury? And does do changes in technology have any, any effect on you? All right. Well, the biggest thing is uh, good and bad is texting, texting and driving. Mm. Texting is the number one stupidest thing anyone can do while they're driving. Um, I've had to sit. Um, I've, I've actually been asked to, to speak to schools about this, but I've had to sit with parents whose child was killed, uh, one was pregnant, and tell them, I can't do anything because your child was texting and driving. Your child crossed the WL lines and hit that truck head on. And I've had to do that a few times, and it's it's horrifying. But texting and driving is the worst thing I've ever seen, and they can disable these phones. I mean, yeah, it's great for personal injury, but you know what? I'd rather not get cases that way. But you've you've been driving down the street, and you see the people in front of you. But they veer off, and all of a sudden they get back in their lane, or 
Well, if you might have even seen an accident because someone is texting and driving. It's unbelievable how bad it is. I can't tell you the the, the epidemic of it. It's it's really really bad. So that has been good and bad. I mean, I get cases out of it. I, I'm not going to complain, but and I wrote a blog article uh, one time and it was please text and drive. It's good for business. Got a lot of attention, but the first line was obviously I'm kidding. Please do not text and drive. It's awful. So that was one part. The second part is um, you can see behind me all these books. I don't know the last time I opened one of these books. It's all it's all online now. Everything's computerized. You know, I still have to. I still love going to the books and just the feel of it, and flipping through pages, and I trust that still. I'm I'm old school like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'd say the first 15 years of practicing law, um, I, I was in the law library a lot, a real lot. Um, I didn't have a computer. When I was in law school, I told I tell my daughter that we had to type papers on rice paper with a typewriter, and then you know do the backspace and white out and all that stuff it was horrendous. Um, even the bar exam now is all electronic. You, you take it on a computer. We had to hand write out ten essay questions. Your hand is like deformed after that. And then we had to do the uh, the first day of all multiple choice with the pencil and the on the bubble, the number two pencil, and everything else. Now it's all online. Click, click, click. Uh, just a couple more questions for you. Is is the uh, um, is what attracted you to becoming an attorney still what is most satisfying about it today after you know twenty five years in your own practice? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've done okay, so uh, monetarily fine, financially fine, but um, I, I think what's the best part of this job is when I get like a card or a note or a phone call to say. You know, thank you so much. You, you cannot believe how you've helped us. And, um, you know, in every time I send a check out, a settlement check to a client, we say, you know, thanks for re- retaining us. Please keep us in mind. Our, our business is dependent on referrals. Um, so, um, yeah, that's it. That's, that's it. I'm guessing getting a client more money from the uh, heart than they would have gotten otherwise from the heartless insurance company is always satisfying as well. Yeah. I mean, I've had people come to me and they say, hey, they try to do it themselves, which is completely insane. Um, like I said, the Babe Ruth analogy is a good one for me. You, you would never do that. So they don't know how much your case is worth because, and you can't go online and look it up. How much my case is worth if I have a whiplash injury with $4,000 in medical bills and $3,000 in lost wages? Bang. Chat GPT probably can't even do that um, because there's too many factors in it. Insurance companies think they have their formula, but I've dispelled that formula a million times, okay, because every case is different. So um, you have to have a lawyer walk you through the whole process. And they know what case is worth. I know what your case is going to be worth at the end. And if they're not in that ballpark, I will give you the right advice. That's really the bottom line. Uh, one more question for you, but first, tell me how people can find out more about the law offices of Robert D. Ahern. Yeah, so uh, we've got two offices, one in Quincy, Massachusetts, another one in uh, Marshfield, Massachusetts. Uh, main number is 617-773-8890. Uh, or you can check out, we have a great rep website, uh, has a lot of information. If you're in an accident, we have actually a brochure you can download what to do if you've been involved in a car accident. And that's attorneyahern.com. It's uh, A-H-E-A-R-N.com. So that's what you get a hold of me. Okay, great. Hey, I know you're, you're you've hired your daughter in the last few years. Um, what advice would you give either either to her or to any attorney, maybe just fresh out of law school, starting their career in personal injury law that only that they wouldn't have learned in law school, but they could just learn from somebody from doing it for twenty five years or more? Uh, I would say that she's in a great spot. First of all, she's under my wing, so mm-hmm. she's gonna learn a lot of things that you'd never be able to learn mm-hmm. in school. Uh, but I'd say the biggest thing, and she's starting to do it now, is network. Get out there and network. Join different networking groups. Uh, I started a networking group in Marshfield uh, about 12, 14 years ago. It's been great. We got 50, 50 people in their professions. I was in a BNI group. I don't know if you've heard of BNI before. Mm-hmm. Business Network International. I was in that group for 16 years. But get out and network join the bowling league, you know, volunteer for stuff, go to your chambers of commerce, get your, your name out there, pass as many cards out there as you can, 
because word of there's nothing like word of mouth uh, referrals. There's nothing better than that. Okay, very and, nice. And these days, I'll tell you one more thing. These days, who does what I did? No one goes. No one graduates from law school and just puts up a shingle. It's too hard. There's too many lawyers. So you got to have your own niche. You got to have your own lane, and then you really got to work that lane by networking, getting out there, doing a good job, get repeat customers, and but it takes a while. It's hard to do. So, but so she's in a really good spot. I'm going to teach her everything I know. Yeah, great. That's awesome. Hey, uh, thank you for all your uh, your time and all your thoughts, insights, and uh, advice and your stories. Really appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure, Chad. Appreciate it. All right, thank you, Bob. So long, everybody. Thanks for listening to 15 Minutes. Be sure to subscribe and we'll see you next time.